Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Marianne Real and I'm a systemic designer, design researcher at Fabla Barcelona. This is one of the Shimet networks. Uh, so we will shortly discover what Shimet uh, is in a short video just right now. SheMix is an international community of partners and labs engaged in empowering women to innovate and contribute to a more sustainable textile and clothing industry. SheMix offers a series of opportunities for inspiration, skills exchange, and networking. SheMix has received funding through the Horizon 2020 program. For more information, see www.shemakes.eu. Today's talk is the last uh, of the TCBL Day 2021 encounter. TCBL is one of the two networks that uh, founded Chimex, along with Fabric Academy, which is a distributed alternative division program inviting students for a learning journey at the intersection between textile, digital fabrication, and biology. We have Anastasia Pistofilou here, our local guru of Chimex one of the co-founders of the program, who will soon present an overview of the course and the work she has been doing in the recent years. But let's introduce our topic today, which is Women Weaving the Future of Textile in Barcelona. We will now invite you to dive into the Barcelona ecosystem, talking with amazing women about current practice and the future of textile, uh, then opening a conversation between us about warmer environment and try to define some ingredients for cooperation when we are designing, crafting, sewing textiles. So before giving the word to each of the speakers, um, I would like to introduce a bit of contextual elements of where we are here. Um, because we are in the Fab Lab of Barcelona, this is situated into the, inside the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, which is in the neighborhood of Poblenou, one of the 73 neighborhoods of Barcelona. And it's interesting to see a bit what's happened in the past, because this place has been shaped by the textile industry. There was a lot of textile factory and mills from the 19th century, until the 70s. This place was named as the Manchester of Catalonia, and it, 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 the neighborhood went uh, from having less than 2,000 inhabitants in 1830 to more than 160,000 one century later. During this period, a rich social credit fabric was woven uh, there at that time and especially promoting with a lot of worker cooperatives and associations. Women played a strong role in this period that supported also their own emancipation. But just for information, uh, we could count at that time twice more women working in the textile factory, but paying twice less than men. Well, after this period, with the Franco regime and the relocalization of the textile industry outside Europe, the productive act activity of Poblenou stopped uh, and uh, left uh, hundreds of workers unemployed. And then the area has taken uh, part in a wave of many urban regeneration plans and have been transformed in an innovation district. And we can still see some trace of the past. Uh, thanks to some old mills that have been transformed, uh, they building the cultural heritage of this industrial period and serving as a new use uh, for local stakeholders, public, private. Uh, it's uh, interesting to see that. And those transformations that happened on the last uh, 20 years uh, also recognize the value of many artists, designer, maker that value the power of creativity, making and are infused by the value of open source, the wish to democratize technology and find new opportunity for producing things locally. So we count many people here in Barcelona co-constructing new narratives for the sustainable 
for the future of sustainable manufacturing in the city. So let's see, Barcelona now has an effervescent place with many emerging practices collective that are within the future of textile design and manufacturing, which care about inclusivity, cultural heritage, uh, circularity, and creativity. A lot of these initiatives are led by women, so I invite you now to discover them, some of them, their story, their practice, and see their vision for the future uh, that uh, they, it's already being built through this, uh, this initiative. So we have uh, today with us four uh, women. Um, we have uh, Alicia Rossello. Hi. Uh, <laughs> from Boudoua uh, uh, and the uh, Festivalet. She will introduce their practice around craft, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite fascinating. Uh, we have online uh, Edith uh, Canales from La Charcha de Dones Cocidores. Uh, Edith that has been recently yes. created in Barcelona. We have Jessica yes. Guy from uh, the Fabra of Barcelona, and she will tell a bit what we are doing toward a, um, how we can foster the connection between maker and manufacturer when um, uh, well, we are thinking about this uh, new narrative toward productive city. And she will talk about networks. And as I mentioned, uh, we have Anastasia Christophil, uh, which will talk about the work she has done in the material and textile department here and all the projects she has been um, well doing since the recent year. So I would let uh, now the work to Alicia, if Hi. it's okay. <laughs> yes, well, um, thanks for inviting me. I'm Alicia Rosselló, I'm from Barcelona. And 15 years ago, I was studying digital design and motion graphics. And I liked it, but I was not very excited about it. What I really loved was doing things with my hands. Mm -hmm. and I decided to quit digital design and start crocheting, <laughs> which was uh, very weird at that time in 2006, and maybe now too. But I decided to um, open a shop, a craft shop in Barcelona. It was one of the first ones that was selling like craft from all around the world. Um, but I quickly realized that people were more interested on learning how to do things and new techniques because Mm, almost like my generation or a lot of like there's a like from I don't know, late 70s probably I would say at least in Spain we have no clue how to sew how to do anything there's a really big tradition in Spain of textile but we were losing that and we're losing that so for me it was like so sad that no one like was continuing any of the traditions and the techniques so I was coming from a digital design world and I felt like Maybe if I change the way the techniques or the artisans or the well, these traditions are viewed by the young audience and it's more appealing and more like contemporary, maybe young people would like to learn and we won't lose any of that. So I started uh, organizing workshops. I organize workshops since 2007 now. And I have a space in Gracia, a neighborhood in town where we teach um, a lot of textiles like macrame, embroidery, sewing, uh, do basket weaving, we work with chessmonite, that is a material resina, I don't know how it's called, resin. <laughs> resin. Uh, we work, we do spoon carving, we do um, electro textiles, bioplastics. Um, it's always like, it's not, it's, one, we want to have fun. The second of, um, goal is that we don't lose these techniques. Third goal is like for me, it's like every technique you can apply in your own field, in what, whatever you want. So it's like just learn the technique and, and maybe you can save some of the techniques that were dying. And it has evolved. At the beginning it was more textile and now it's like more open. But, um, I never thought I would be like 15 years doing what I'm doing and people <laughs> will keep coming. I have a lot of uh, teachers that come from South America or other countries, which is very exciting because thanks to the internet, I can reach a bigger audience. 
Um, and I stopped talking about the Duwama because I have three projects that always are surrounded by, like, it's always around craft because I love craft. So I also started a festival, a craft fair in 2009 that is called Festivalet. It's every December in Barcelona. And um, I can, we can show you a video on how, why it's Festivalet. It's easier to understand. <laughs> So Festivalet is that uh, was one of the first fairs, craft fairs in Barcelona and Spain. Um, we have an open call every September. Everyone is invited to come uh, from worldwide. We have participants from South America, from Europe, even from Africa, uh, but mostly from Spain. And uh, there's like a lot of techniques, textile, but other like pottery, jewelry, um, design, like a lot of um, when natural cosmetics, etc. Everything like the goal is that everything is handmade or locally produced, uh, ecologic, uh, or we can trace the origin of the product. And it has been it started with eight booths and now has been growing slowly every edition. We're gonna do the 14th edition this year and we have like 100 vendors and more or less like 8,000 visitors which is a proof that people uh, they are really like changing their minds and are interested in those kind of projects. And my third project is something called Talleres Nomadas, that I uh, translated it's like nomad workshops. I uh, started in 2015 because um, I love to travel, but when I travel, I'm more interested in going to see the craft shops, the materials, the artist studios, the artisans, I'm not interested in checking the local Sagrada Familia or the monuments I'm supposed to see. So um, I started in 2015 going to Morocco, to Marrakech, and doing workshops and learning with local artisans. We're doing pottery, um, embroidery, uh, weaving, and then we also went to the mountains to see how the rugs are made and all the process from the ship to the final rug. And now we're also doing um, nomad workshops in Guatemala, in, in Central America, in Mallorca, in Spain, and we're preparing some others in Greece, and Japan, and Sicily. And it's something that I started like, yeah, something I like to do because it's fun to travel and other geeks and nerds around the world that loves crafts, maybe they will join me. And that's what happened. So it was never on my mind to do this project, but it was like people wanted to travel with me and learn with artisans. So here we are. <laughs> and um, this is more or less what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Did you see me? Uh, maybe <laughs> we're good on time. <laughs> so. Thank you. And um, so this is uh, Alisa. Uh, I really like the, the color and all this energy that there was also on the photo that we were uh, presenting. Yeah. Uh, so now we will listen to uh, Edith, uh, which is online, and we will talk uh, about uh, Chacha de Dones Cosidore. Let's see the story. Okay. Hi, Edith. Hi, everyone. Hi. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, women. Uh, thanks for our invitation. The Cachada de Dones Cosedora is a project of 10, 10 sewing groups from Barcelona and its surroundings. Um, through some first meeting 
promoted mainly by the Paris Manuel Foundation and the Tetras Cooperative, and decided to unite as a big group uh, network to work connected and give greater visibility than if each group were working separately, and that's made in their needs. Um, and the objective, the La Charcha, and divided into two lines. One, one hand, community support with each of the, the 10 groups and between groups, and between the Charcha and the neighborhood groups. Uh, this is done uh, through meetings, activities that promote synergies, care, and Chinese activities, now just showing. And the second line is the productive sphere, which for now, for now, aim, aims for economy activity to be complementary and not the only income for, for the women of, of the groups. Um, since the formation of the Charta, it had the accompaniment and support of the Paris Manuel Foundation, the etc. Cooperative, and the uh, financial support of the Barcelona City Council and Barcelona Activa, principally. Um, uh, in, in the sense of production, each of the 10 group has its own identity and products, which are working in the Charter Workshop. Um, production orders, um, one, one way is our um, uh, the production of their 10 groups, and other is the production orders are also received between the 40 participants of the Charter. That why that moment of production is carried out within um, the Church Workshop. The Church Workshop is located in City Barcelona in the space in shared with a Casal and Young Grand. Casal and Young Grand, which are living um, only in, in our country, is, is a living space for elderly and neighborhood. Um, well, in, in space and workshop the charter. And other side regarding the organization in the charter, there is a weekly assembly, uh, some decisions and made and the uh, assembly system. Currently work being done on the legal construction, on the network in the development um, and process of vegan and cooperative or not, an association or not, always for, always, always from a participatory and good way. Um, from, from the church, we see it possible to work and continue working locally, proximity, collaborate and commission from entrepreneurs or public administration, covering only the work that we can of course, agreeing with the same line of values. Is uh, um, uh, currently uh, our job is participating in articulating to textile sector in Catalonia and other groups. Therefore, that is where we call locate to current work in the charta, articulate with the other sixteen sectors. Thanks, Edith. Um, we have been uh, discovering the Tasha de Domestos Idores with Anastasia recently in the Festival uh, of uh, Social Economy of Catalonia. It was really nice to see all this social initiative. And I think when we talk about textile uh, in Barcelona and how we can rethink about how we could be productive and also making chacha, which means red uh, in Spanish, but network in English. Uh, <laughs> we, we really have the value of social economy and all this uh, ecosystem that is being present uh, behind each initiative is really, really uh, interesting. Uh, and I think also when we uh, are moving from uh, this Sewing Collective, and now we will talk a bit more of uh, Networks. This is the platform 
uh, which is being developed uh, locally here. Another whole story. But uh, Jessica will uh, will uh, now uh, well share with us. Uh, I think it's super important to see the um, complementary of this uh, different initiative and the, this platform can help also it's in a way to synergize to connect uh, different people who need this to by sustain their activity in a way and to see how they can also maybe share differently the resources much like the space and uh, yeah so jessica uh, if you can <laughs> share the story of mapbox and a bit of what you're doing in the parlor Yes, thanks, Marion. You already brought up quite some nice topics there, which is like in the essence of MakeWorks. To give a brief recap about what MakeWorks actually is, because it might be new for some of the audience members. <laughs> so, MakeWorks is an initiative or a project that is located and hosted here at Fabla Barcelona, and um, but actually it has a longer history than that. So, it is originally from Scotland. It's from a person called Fionn, who decided during their master's studies or bachelor's studies that she they really struggle finding manufacturers because manufacturers often don't have a website or it's around the corner behind a garage and it's very hard sometimes to find as a designer a manufacturer to create or to produce things in the medium scale like not large scale but the medium um, or small to medium scale so with this idea they traveled around scotland and made her the whole project, a master project around making local manufacturing accessible in Scotland. This was quite a while ago and inspired many other regions to do the same. So what MakeWorks is today basically is a collective or an accumulation of regions in Europe and beyond who are interested in making local production accessible. So we are currently around 10 regions. This comes from all the way up in the cold north from Iceland, all around Europe, and goes to the UAE. And um, which is really interesting is that you can see MakeWorks, the platform itself, kind of like an open library, a public library, which in which you can enter um, and find who you are looking for to make things happen. So if I am a person, a designer, a small company, maybe even a bigger company, and I'm searching for a producer, this is where I, I might find local production uh, facilities or even material suppliers or whatsoever. Today I'm representing actually MakeWorks Catalonia because we are also establishing our own region here. We're testing it kind of in Poblano in the area in the neighborhood which we are in. And Marion already gave a really nice introduction about our textile background and the industrial background of uh, Catalonia or of Barcelona. So that plays also a huge role in the narrative of our area. So as you mentioned before, we have a, a background in textile and general and industry. We have like the small Manchester or the, the Spanish Manchester scene here. And so there's a lot of productivity, but if you have been in Poblano before or in Barcelona, you know that you cannot always necessarily see these kind of amazing creative uh, people. So they're often hidden here beside, behind garage doors or whatsoever. So um, what we're doing right now is really engaging with um, the local productivity of our area, talking with manufacturers, um, making, giving them the visibility they deserve. Because through different reasons, as also you mentioned before, the crafts, uh, especially in the craft sector, many things are disappearing, knowledge is disappearing, companies have to close down to whatever environmental or legal issues um, so it's really, or economic issues, so it's really difficult for many companies to stay alive. We try so, so to support the uh, local economy by giving these people visibility and trying to, to connect the local productivity to the people who want to make here. To not always find <laughs> someone in China or in another area of the world where it might be cheaper or whatsoever, but actually bring it to the place where you want to make to make the distances between where you sell or where you want to engage with the communities of people very short. Um, so yeah, this is basically MakeWorks and <laughs> different stories, but essentially what you can, uh, uh, the essence of it is basically a platform in which we have the different regions established 
Um, also emerging regions like, for example, Paris or Milan coming up, they're trying to show their local productivity. For example, Sweden is a really nice example. They have a core focus only on the textile industry in comparison for Paris, for example, they are looking into food. So we have the diversity of the regions. They showcase their own narrative. And here in Catalonia, we have uh, brilliant people, creative people, we really try to find more of them as well, but already showcase the productivity we have here, here locally. Yeah, we have been seeing some picture on the screen. Uh, <laughs> you have been uh, seeing this picture. There was also from the local company that you have been uh, also already on the, the website, which yeah. is the Zanelli. Exactly. So yeah. one of the nice examples is actually um, we have some really amazing women makers here. Um, Zanelli is one of the ones that you just mentioned. They're literally around the corner. You would not, never know them if you haven't met them probably because it's in a big building with no name. And yeah, they work mainly with uh, leather and, and textile, but there's also old textile fabricas in Raval, which they host also creative people like, for example, Penny P. Bags. She's also like a woman entrepreneur working alone, being the multitask person, as I mean, many people maybe know, like doing everything in her own company and producing her, um, her brand within that old textile elementary. This is a nice thing where the story of the area connects with a craftsperson, a manufacturer, a designer, or whatsoever, uh, to today, and still in the textile sector, section. So that is really interesting to see often. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Um, yes, yeah, so now we can move on to the last uh, speaker, uh, before we go some, uh, to do some conversation. Um, really uh, living at the same place, evaluating, a lot on uh, this uh, uh, ecosystem of the fab lab and the makers. So now uh, I will let Anastasia Pistofide uh, talk about uh, all the story of material and textile here in Barcelona and also leading the She Makes project. Uh, we're, we're working together uh, on the project. So yeah, if we can now share the, the screen and um, present a bit yes. this amazing work. So, thank you, Marion. Uh, it is uh, very... Uh, I will share my screen, yes. <laughs> it's very nice uh, to organize this session. It is so funny because um, also uh, the, the story, let's say, of the Fab Textiles Lab, which now is called Material and Textiles, started with workshops. <laughs> Basically, the, the thing is that the Fab Lab Barcelona is a pioneer lab, uh, first in Europe, bringing all of the concepts of the uh, socialization of new technologies and making it accessible to the wider public. And, and uh, the mission, uh, since uh, it was founded like in 2007, uh, is to... Uh, make this accessible to the public. No? So when I started working, uh, I started uh, making uh, different workshops uh, here at the Pablo Barcelona, but they were not around textiles. Mm -hmm. They were around the different fabrication technologies like molding and casting, uh, electronics, 3D printing. And at that point, uh, in, uh, there was nobody else uh, that was doing this. So it was really impactful uh, to not only have programs that they are inside the fab lab, but also open workshops. So we started with this uh, series of weekend workshops, where it says for the open to the public, quite accessible. And uh, in the series, we say, OK, we do all of these different techniques. And we had people coming from the district, from around, curious ones, the weird ones at that moment and that they wanted to know about the 3D printing and everything. And at some point, they say, OK, let's make a workshop like a called Hack a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And we can use any kind of technology that we have here in the fab lab, but applied to a T-shirt. And then in this workshop, I realized that uh, the profile of the people that came were coming more from artistic background, mm -hmm. more from creative or fashion, or more soft skills. 
more women. So I said, oh, here uh, I have a new uh, target group. I have uh, something that is not the normal engineer profile or pro programmer profile or architect profile that you would see. But I have people around, there is the design uh, schools and all of these that they are actually opening a new door for applying these new technologies uh, to a different field, which is the textile and clothing industry. And I never had the intention also to go to fashion because textile for me is super broad. It's uh, from architectural, architectural textiles, agricultural textiles, technical, medicine, medicine based interior design and so in 2012 after doing a series of workshops like uh, um, six screen printing with a vinyl cutter, uh, 3D printing other fabrics, we, we applied for a small fund and uh, we decided to open the Fab Textiles research line and um, since then uh, I have been working uh, a lot with different workshops but always keeping the mentality that the FabLab network has, which is that everything is in a globe, it can be replicated globally, and everything is accessible and open source. Mm -hmm. So the way that um, I uh, started the Fab Textiles was, um, was by having a web page where you can actually enter and find everything, all the experiments. So but one part is the research, the other part is the making, the, ex the experimentation, the, all the process until you get to the result. But the third part is the documentation. And this is very important. So in the Fabula world, this is something like a common language but maybe in the local level of also looking into the different uh, languages that everybody speaks, maybe this is something not uh, useful. But in our FabLab uh, world, the network is the same important the, if you do something and the same importance if you document. Mm -hmm. And the good thing and the weird thing was that through all of this documentation, because on the web page you could find how to make a simple t-shirt, or how to make a 3D printing on fabrics, or how to make it like electroluminescent paint, all of these things. Many other people uh, started following these um, uh, learnings, and we did different projects, like making origami hats, and opening the source code, so then you would have pictures, people sending email, ah, I made this hat in Ecuador, or I made this hat bag in Africa. And suddenly it was something, I think because of the FabLab network that is enabling this connectivity, the research of the Fab Textiles was something that was going out in the FabLab world more and more. And so I got the possibility and the opportunity to travel all around and share these practices with labs that they didn't have this research agenda at that moment. Uh, so it was quite pioneering, and then in the end, the, after all of these experiments, because in the beginning it's very intuitive, we could uh, put four topics that they are the main topics of research under this textile and material agenda. The first one is the digital fabrication. So applied on the textile and fashion, and uh, clothing industry is 3D printing for textiles, 3D printing for personalized uh, local production, but also like laser cutting, being able to have files that they can be adapted. Then uh, the second research line is uh, augmenting our garments and creating performative and smart garments, which is more uh, oriented to electronic textiles. Also, there is a big craft community of electronic textiles that I had the opportunity to join and so all these practices were also open source from the beginning I would find resources to learn and so the e-textile uh, group then the parametric design what we say is that we don't create a product but we create code that can lead you to different customized and multiple designs so data it can be informed by data design and the last one is the bio design so after 
having this practice, how you can look into the materials that you're using and try to either create your own materials or resource, recycle, reuse waste. Mainly in the textile lab here, most of the fabrics that I have there because they are recycled from a company or an industry or someone gifted them or from a costume of, of a theater that closed and then I got them. So it's always like this. So, so but also the bio design create new materials. So there are different applications that we have research on the 3D printing as fabrics, electronic textiles, the parametric design. And then the one of the also bigger um, part, which is looking into the material circularity, which is the bio design. So a lot of different projects that have been developed and a lot of uh, open source knowledge that is served either in the format of a blog post or in small little zines publications that everybody can uh, go through. And the idea is to give very easy access to these kind of techniques and uh, like science. No? Because sometimes when you uh, see the biomaterials and bioplastics, oh, chemistry and biology, maybe this can be somehow overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So how you can create something that is an easy entrance to these topics with a form of easy language or like a cookbook, no? like something that is, is accessible, then after you can start opening the topics of, yeah, this is actually chemistry, but this is actually biology. But, and working a lot with the different uh, biomaterials, so every year like a different biomaterial, focusing a lot of the research, finishing a publication, even with mycelium, so different publications that the, they have been, uh, and it's super nice because many people write, oh, I followed this recipe, but, and send me some pictures and say, okay, yeah. I think that there is also this, um, a, when you are open source, you should respond up to everyone, even if you're tired. So <laughs> if, because you've done it, because you have published out there all of the information and there is a certain amount of responsibility. So yes, this may take some time of my time that is not never like paid, let's say, but there is this responsibility. Yes, if you have put it out there, then also be responsible to respond to a question. And the nice thing was that um, in 2014, uh, we were organizing here the Fab Lab conference, and I said, okay, I will organize a big exhibition to showcase everything that we have been doing here and make my own mannequins, mm -hmm. uh, because I, uh, renting mannequin is just not sustainable <laughs> in cost and also in the mannequin, like the discarding mannequin. So I invited many uh, the Fab Network to participate in this first digital fashion and wearable exhibition, and it was the moment where all of this network started to be created. So the first year I invited different uh, pioneers at that moment that they were working in this intersection of digital fabrication and textiles and wearables. The second year in Boston, inviting also local designers. The third year in Paris, the fourth year. So after having also different formats of thinking fashion, uh, not maybe with a a catwalk, but in a different way, because we don't want to be in the standard. And, uh, and then uh, it was a tipping moment where also the network somehow needed a new educational program that I will talk about a little bit later. But here in the textile um, lab, we had also the opportunity to do collaborations with professionals. So, so not only research, but also mm -hmm. kind of research and development for production. So collaborating with fashion designer, one-to-one -one collaboration and mentoring. Some cases creating biomaterials, in this case, that you see textile done with bacteria or algae leather or mycelium hats. And textile done with bacteria is uh, something that uh, is uh, also an easy way to understand biology and uh, encouraging the participant and the designer 
not only to come and collaborate with us, but also to learn how to do it and take this knowledge at home and be able to do it on her own, uh, or um, rescuing all heritage craft techniques, another collaboration with a designer where we leather molded uh, accessories and, and garments, and also we complemented the, the, um, the line with some 3D printed jewelry that then afterwards they were cast in gold and, and uh, silver. So for completely changing the method of production and having a printer printing and using this as a mold for a uh, casting method. And uh, then also we have other projects here at the Fala Barcelona that uh, have to do with incubation, incubation of ideas, incubation of designers, one of which is the Remix El Barrio which is a big project that has started with all of the research of food waste. And it's a super beautiful one because you see in the end how you can take the science out of the lab to the street. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, because this is the impactful part. When you're not closed in your laboratory, but actually you bring all of this uh, out and you create a movement. Huh? So Remix El Barrio was an incubation project in Paula Barcelona, and it resulted to be a collective, a collective of designers, that they are full waste material makers, and we did many different design objects and products from organic waste using the local ecosystem, like restaurants, gardens, urban gardens, association of neighbors, to use this waste, and it's very inventive because everyone had different uh, waste and they were making also different kind of products. And I will uh, let you see a little video about uh, also the counterpart that I talked before, you know, that is not only doing it, but also documenting it, which is very important. So this can be replicated in other places all over the world. So uh, this means that uh, here we made a pilot locally, but uh, then after with all the documentation and open source tutorials, everybody can replicate this in another place, in another city, in another village, in another small scale or big scale. So uh, my, my project that I'm currently working most is the educational part, which uh, is also working in a networked way. So it is this uh, program that uh, it is in a hybrid education in the intersection of textiles, digital publication, and biology. And it is somehow a combination of all of these diverse ideas, crazy ideas, that maybe they don't fit in one box, but maybe also they um, they do. Uh, they don't fit in one box, but maybe it's a convergence of new disciplines that are needed in our society. You know? So maybe the fashion designer will not be as we knew it before, but will be someone that has different skills. No? And this is Fabric Academy. It has been hybrid since uh, the beginning, since 2017. And many places all over the world uh, are following this program simultaneously. Of course, there is uh, in the importance of outreaching also to countries that maybe they don't have access to such education, mm -hmm. and also offering scholarships to 
uh, places that they have really the textile production, but they cannot uh, access to these new technologies. And this is the mission, of course, this is the same mission of the Fab Lab Network, but in this case applied to a specific uh, industry, which is the textile and clothing industry. Then we have different formats of, um, of uh, um, people that are involved in that. But uh, we can also see that our target group, even though we didn't intend to have women in that, in the end, the target group is 85% female. And I think that the impact of that is that there is a lot of empowerment because we are in a place where it is thought to be more engineer oriented, but this is changing. So I feel that the participants, when they finish this program, they are really empowered because they can code, they can use any kind of tool, they can, and they can make their own career and they can empower others. No? So that's, that's the nice part of it. And I will not uh, talk uh, again about the different aspects of the Fabric Academy. I've shown them in the different classes, but again, we have different projects of sustainability, of application of how in one laboratory you don't make prototype, but you can make final product nowadays. And um, different store, and also the, uh, accomp the accompaniment, the, the accompany our participants to their further professional life by giving them a lot of opportunities. Uh, so Fabricadem in the end is an uh, opportunity network and uh, it is continuous and also makes different connections between the participants one, with one and the other. And the reflection of this program is that it is kind of bridging the gap between education and, and uh, industry because also it has no age. We say that education has no age under the new technologies. Everybody is a new beginner. So there is like participants from 18 to 65 year old in the same classroom, which is nice. I guess it's the same with the workshop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, that these kind of new disciplines are kind of responding to what are the societal needs for uh, industrial manufacturing nowadays, but also empowering people to create their own career path. Mm. So last, the last um, project that I would like to show is the platform. So it's a platform for open source circular patterns. And uh, so it's called open source circular fashion. And it is thought that everyone can upload their pattern and it is in vectorial format. So when you download it, you can customize and make it, uh, make adjustments or make, it's not like the old way where you scan paper and then you print out, but everybody can um, directly use a laser cutter to fabricate and also it has a lot of modular patterns inside. So I invite you all to see and check and try, upload your designs on this uh, platform and create and your products. Thank you. <laughs> so much to say about <laughs> this program. <laughs> it's super interesting to to see really the the story uh, and how this program in itself show a lot of uh, new narratives that could come uh, for this uh, world of textile and fashion. Um, now we will start a bit uh, more conversing uh, with uh, each other and um, maybe um, as a first one I would like to come back on this topic uh, that is really at the core of the Shimex project which is uh, what is the role of women, uh, the role of gender uh, and women empowerment uh, when we are uh, doing this uh, new initiative, activity and how you, as a woman, you feel, in a way, uh, supported, empowered by your own practice. Um, so in Shimek, what we want is really to put women in front of the scene, but in their diversity, um, evoking the importance and the complexity of self-confidence when we are doing things, uh, caring, and uh, also leadership. Um, we revise the notion of role model uh, and uh, we would like now to 
showcase some work that has been done uh, here. Um, there is a five interview of uh, Fab Public Academy, Academy alumni um, that uh, has been uh, realized uh, as a way to really enter in the feeling and the practice of uh, what has been uh, been doing during this uh, this public academy course and also what, how they feel about of this. So we will now have a look at this video uh, of uh, four women. Um, Si yo me siento empoderada con el uso de las herramientas yo misma, sí, y creo que eso me hace sentir empoderada y como más libre también a la hora de crear. We are getting into machines, getting into technology. It's a huge playground for everyone who wanna get involved. I think if I was to go down the architecture route, I probably would have felt a little bit more of the, the inequality within the industry. It was a fashion industry, but it was like, you know, this kind of tasks are for women and these kind of tasks are for men and it was really like really tough. The gender of women are playing a bigger, bigger role than, than before uh, for, for the reason probably because we are matching now the fashion uh, with, uh, with the scientific part. Actually there are women in, in different kind of uh, roles and positions of the fashion industry but they don't use machines other than the sewing machine or the knitting machine. Mi sueño es algún día tener una ferretería feminista porque es el lugar donde yo llego y me presento y siempre me miran como diciendo aquí vienes a buscar aquí. That are dangerous tools so only men can use them. <laughs> I think it's also about us empowering ourselves, don't being scared about doing things and just learning and doing and trying to do it. Creo que eso es súper valioso, estar en un lugar donde sea igualitario y donde todos podamos coger las herramientas y trabajar con ellas. Es como, bueno, desligar todo de esta cuestión de, de separar por géneros, ¿no? Personally, I didn't feel any gender imbalance, but I know and I'm aware that this tech environment is mainly for men, but I think it's something uh, that is coming from the past. We are changing these, these mindsets. The biodesign, the biofabrication um, field um, is very much female-led and I wonder and I often think about this so why why is it more female-led um, and perhaps it's because women are more inclined to be nurturing and compassionate towards nature and design and, and, and organisms. I work in a group where the majority are women and I feel very comfortable and comfortable in that because my jefe and my director are not here, but they are on the side of me and we work as a team where the opinion of everyone vale por igual y es una forma mucho más horizontal. I, I definitely am happy to be in a place that I'm surrounded by inspiring women. Nice. Well, we will see some reaction now. Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting uh, to see uh, also uh, what who were uh, you role model, role model? Um, what was this um, inspiring um, woman uh, that really shaped you know the practice that uh, you have uh, you you are now developing. Uh, who want to start to uh, give us some uh, some impression mm -hmm. on this? Uh... Well, uh, maybe I can start. So <laughs> let's ask. So if you said, um, I honestly, in the beginning, I never thought that I was going to do something just for women. It was not my goal. I never. I thought like, well, we're in the twenty one century, so this like doesn't exist anymore. That was on my mind. I was twenty one years old. And I thought like, yeah, this is like not anymore. And then I realized after 50 years that I don't do things intended just for women. It's just a technique. But nowadays, after 15 years, maybe I have four men every year. So I will say like my percentage of women, maybe it's like 98%. And I, I thought at the beginning, because it was more textile. So textile is really like in the history women have like been in textile, like, you know, embroidery, weaving, sewing, etc. And I thought like, well, maybe if I start doing other stuff, because I'm always very curious with techniques, I'm like, oh, I want to learn bioplastic, or I want to do, um, yeah, I don't know, basket weaving. Uh, I thought like, maybe more men will come. 
Uh, but no. So I was working with leather and wood and bioplastics. I even did like Arduino with lily pad with textiles, <laughs> but no one, like no men show up. Then I did the Tejeros Nomadas, no men show up. Um, for like six years, I think I only had um, one client, uh, men. And, and then I was like, oh, maybe we're not so, you know, we're like in the 20th century. Uh, so then I realized like, oh, I'm creating a business for women. And I'm a woman, but honestly, I never thought about that until then, maybe six months ago, one year, I was like, oh, you know, it wasn't ever in my mind, these different. Uh, I don't work so much with technology mixed with craft like you do. But yeah, and I mean, I totally understand the video we just saw because like, it's always like, oh, men are more like for machines and women are more like manually. And honestly, it means kind of sad that we're still having to like, you know, you know, make this difference. And I always say like, I don't understand why men don't realize that there's no, like, they can also go on textile. Also that all the ways the fa celebrity fashion designers are men. And um, every, it's, but I don't know, it's like, I don't know what you think about that, but I thought like it was over, but it's not over anymore, this difference. And it's kind of sad, honestly. Like, but well, maybe men didn't realize yet how fun everything, like techniques and craft are, but no. <laughs> I don't know what you think about it. <laughs> I think there was something also said in that video, which I can resonate a lot. We should detach it from gender and times. Mm -hmm because sewing doesn't have a gender and working with a CNC machine doesn't have a gender. Mm -hmm. However you identify with, mm -hmm. if it may be male, female, or whatever, you should be, there should be environments in which you feel that there is a space for you to learn whatever you want to learn. And I think that is crucial that whoever we got inspired by, if it came from our own inspiration or from maybe other people, that we further nurture these kind of environments in which people feel engaged to learn the new techniques, old techniques, whatever. Um, and I think it's a nice reflection you have, no? Like you didn't intend to have it in that specific direction with maybe female or feminine identifying people coming, but it happened. Mm -hmm. And that is nice as well, because I mean, there are some environments where it's maybe the opposite or it, 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 like is attracting a different type of people um, and there doesn't need to be necessarily thing always you don't have to open it up always start it because i think it also closes the door with some mm. other people mm. i don't know if i can translate this well but in times where groups are more diverse some people don't feel as much as they can be part of because it's too diverse they don't mm. feel identified with that group so much so sometimes it's nice to have a group that maybe it's just female or just yeah. that or just that. And sometimes it's nice to have diverse mm. groups as well, because everyone is very different in, in which environments they feel empowered or feel part of the group now. And that is something that I thought a lot when I heard the questions. It's so, so context and personalized based. So it, was it is part. like culture, no? See, yeah, because exactly. in the end, uh, some, I am a um, foreigner in a, in a country that I'm not, I was not raised here. Yeah. And uh, many times I also feel that there are some communication constraints because of the culture that someone comes from a different background who carries all this suitcase of culture and the way that has been brought up. And uh, of course, we are uh, Western, so our gender uh, divide is a little bit uh, smaller now. Like, but if you go also to other countries, uh, in Arab countries uh, or in uh, Asia, no, you can see that this is even greater. Uh, so I think that. Yes, we can be now very flexible and be genderless, especially the the whole like must thing would <laughs> be a good like, good thing to not like more anonymous but non 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 like binary, not like and um, 
and in, in, in the sense of like getting inspiration, I, I, I would say that there is a part where we get inspired by a similar uh, people, no? like that there is kind of like a role model and you say, I, I want to like do like do I is doing to do the <laughs> workshops in my country and you know, like you, you have some like reference. You could also be inspired from your culture and country and mother and, and family. Um, for me, it's more inspiration from all of these people that they have documented all of the things that I know. And I think that the fact that we are in so connected nowadays, it is helping us a lot to, to make this digital, the divide of the gender mm -hmm. to like really, and the cultural gender divide as well, to really like uh, make limited, mm -hmm. to make it even uh, smaller. Yes. When I am in a group of friends that they are from Greece, I feel more comfortable mm -hmm. because they can understand my irony. They can understand my. That's exactly the yeah. point. No? Like sometimes it's easier to be in the group of people you feel alike because it gives you more possibilities yeah. to, to express yourself. I had uh, in public academy uh, some uh, men participant, uh, but they cannot handle it. If there's an really? only one, a woman and one man, they cannot really handle mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So I get, I mean, the, the problem uh, is that uh, it, somehow we need to talk in different language. So we can say uh, robotic textiles and then men will come or you say, you need to like in, in, yeah. invent uh, something that gives you the whole picture that is not about only yeah. something but it's a technique or the craftsman or maybe have a, a role model of an old artisan that is a man that is old and you can I see tried that. this it did not work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like I'm gonna put a man I have teachers that are men not even men come to the workshop but I don't mind like <laughs> but it's like really like we're not very, and what, for example, I realized uh, traveling, it's like, for example, you were saying in Arabic country, so uh, in Morocco, um, for example, some techniques are, textile techniques are only for men, some textile techniques are only for women, like tradition, like weaving a, a rag is only for women, embroidery is only for women, but pottery and weaving in the Lata de Jalisco, which I don't know. <laughs> another kind of loom, it's only for men. So I was like asking why, they don't even know why, it's like this and that's it. And what I realized that, for example, in Europe or Western countries, <clears throat> when you weave or you do any craft or a lot of people like, they believe they are, or they think as themselves as artists or artisans, Hobby. Hobby. or like, but they feel like creative and when you go to these countries, for example, realize that they don't believe that they are artists or anything. They're just like women, most of the women, like they learn how to weave or how to embroidery when they were kids because the mom taught them just because they could be able to make some money to help the family. So they never, like, they make like amazing things like, I don't know, racks that are like three per eight meters and group of 15 uh, women that they have organized with cooperative, but they don't think they are artists, they're just like doing something to make some money. So by going there with a group of, I don't know, 12 ladies from different countries, from Europe, uh, women in Morocco at the beginning, they were like, why are you interested in this? Just like, we're just making a rap. And all of us we were like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> That's how you do it. This is the best. Like in Europe, no one else like is doing this. Like everything is like like disappearing. Went to China, or it's made by a machine, or it's a hobby. They don't understand that concept. And then I realized after like going there uh, several times that they were like empowering them because like some ladies, um, some ladies wanted to, like, they realized, like, oh, 12 strangers from Europe come here, and now, like, and they like what we do, so maybe what we do is important, so now they're, like, some of them, now they, 
valorize yeah they see their value no? so it's like i realized that you know in our culture now it's more like sometimes like hobby and in their culture it's like i just do this to make some money so now like when we mix that so they empower and now they are being more creative and create their own patterns and like trying things and we show what we do so that's really cool but it's like it blows my mind at the beginning because it was like yes and i think at the same time there is also this uh, uh what we were mentioning a bit there is this volunteer to scale a bit or to try to live with craft with uh, trying more to sell product and i think the uh, the initiative of uh, judges uh, the dones uh, collect uh, the dones cosidores the edit but I, I, it, it's super interesting uh, to uh, to to feel maybe your feedback on this because I, I what I listened here it was a lot of um, the, this uh, needs this need to be um, to, to check the diversity to see some moments or we need to embrace uh, all uh, the well the complexity of involving men in. Um, in our activity and at the same time um, I think all what we were want to bring is that this uh, feeling of empowerment this need to have some safe space to discuss to be to express uh, is super important and I, I have the feeling that in the this sewing collective is something that really uh, emerged naturally um, Okay, uh, thank you. It's, it's very difficult to uh, talk in, in online with, with, with intervention. Well, um, I agree with with you um, when all that this difference between a uh, woman and men that, uh, for uh, project lives and um, principally in, in between people, but is very important the difference in between gender, though. So, um, well, for first time, uh, community wars, women's network like the one now stirs hand in Morocco. So, in Morocco, uh, Morocco too uh, had been part of the inspiration of the church. Uh, however, we have not now any model that is our reference which uh, we say we want to reach because the work on the charter has been to try modify proposal try again a mystic proposing another um it's had got trouble several times which also has to has to do with this work that we continue to consolidate uh, and always it is very important for um, for 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 the charter, that always taking into account the life trajectory of women, and, and group decision making, because um, principally is a family conciliation in in, in the in the job, in the job in the sewing in the sewing a workshop and other other activities is important. Um, uh, actually, for now, for now, we are all women. Is what happened like this? You no, know, um, in 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 all the groups, uh, it has united use in um, identifying and comparing our needs and discovering that they were shared. Red glass of the difference between each group. And the need is same. So the, it's very important to remember that the women who participate in the church come from a group were dynamic before forming a network in their group. Which is why working and coexisting in the church community has been close. Um, and feminines. Well, in the feminines in the world is it, it's not, not complicated, but um, not 
not all agree with the findings or the word with the word findings. And there are our uh, constant and critical question about our work as a sewing group, care and training activities, and we define meanings. Is for now is is this, but it's it's important to remember. So um, the this work principally is for made for migrant women. So and vulnera in vulnerability vulnerability. So is um so are are many are many contexts are, are, are many spheres in, in, in the groups. No, no, so I, if you <laughs> yes uh yeah 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 I think uh and all this topic uh, that uh, we just bring now, and I think the, also the perspective of feminism, and I think we would uh, benefit also from taking uh, more time and uh, people to explore all what has been done in Barcelona in the uh, eco-feminism approach. Uh, and uh, there is really, uh, it's really a city engaged uh, to children. To I think in a way it allows this creativity and. Uh, create some um, environment to be quite uh, safe to express uh, and well a bit also exploring art, uh, design, craft uh, at, uh, at the same time. Uh, what's inside? How did you feel uh, co-creation when you were creating Public Academy, Tudua and Networks, Nupala and the churches? What, uh, what are these ingredients? I think you're the one more advanced with co-creation and with collaboration because I'm kind of jealous of your, um, you know, like fab labs and everything started, you know, like um, open source. It's always like open source, always in about sharing, you know, what you were explaining. And in my field, it's different because it's like copyrights and patterns and people is not, at least they don't want to like share. Like uh, sharing was like, seen as a bad thing and now it's changing a little bit thanks to the open source community but we're still not on that and I think we should learn from that community and you're more advanced. <laughs> the community itself has to learn a lot uh, as well. I mean if we... So basically the thing is that if I was doing all of the different things that I'm doing I would probably need to like open uh, 100 different companies. <laughs> so you can also open this and give the opportunity to others because you're not going to do that mm -hmm. first. And secondly, is like this uh, typical example that if you have a group of researchers in a company that they are doing something under a patent for uh, they cannot share anything so they will do like research very meticulous and they are four but then if you open your research and put mm. it out in the world then the world will be million people working yeah. together on making this happen so all the intelligence of the world will come together and things will move forward if you are contributing with something good, no? like something that will help the people or empower them. Mm -hmm. So there is no economical good model of open source. And there are a few examples, like the precious plastic community is mm -hmm. a good example of open source, like in terms of economy, let's say. And this is because also the, when we went back in 2014 uh, here in Paula Barcelona, we invited uh, two lawyers to help us create a market, a market platform. Mm -hmm. and, and we told them that we want this to be open source. And the lawyers, they said, we don't know what is this. <laughs> and uh, then it's also like the policy and all the laws and everything that they need to catch up with what is happening in the world these things are a lot slow it's like education yeah 
So educate. That's why you have informal education. You have online education nowadays. You have hybrid education because some things they are more difficult to change if they are big or if they are under like a public um, that you have to write uh, the curriculum and it has to be approved and it has to be staying yeah. the same for many years. So I think that the in to come back to the co-creation. I think that it requires uh, to be, uh, and, the, and the word I comes in Greek, and it's a very nice word, I don't know how to translate it in English now, <laughs> to, to be like humble mm -hmm. uh, because nobody invented the wheel mm. and you learn from the others mm. and, and you need to be humble, but at the same time, you need to give attribution mm. to all the ones that have contributed to you being here now. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is very important. And then in uh, taking decisions commonly, this is something that is quite complex uh, and it requires patience. patience. So basically in co-creation I would say that you, you have to be uh, humble to understand that the, the, you're doing something for the world and not for you. Mm -hmm. And then you also need to be patient to be able to listen to everyone because they come from different culture, they have different needs, because they, they, they want other things. So mm -hmm. you, oh, these are the things I, that I would say are important. Yeah, uh, I can agree on many things. <laughs> Um, I think we've mentioned also quite a few things already before. I think there are many ingredients, as you said, to co-creation, like the listening, to be humble, to be patient. And I think one thing that maybe I'm missing, or the one thing I would kind of like add to this list is this kind of like session zero. I think that is the moment where we come together the first time, whoever these people might be, and we talk about what is actually the purpose or the vision or the ideas or the personal perspectives and needs and things we want to do. Because if there's a moment in a year or two or later where there might be conflict or questions or something, there's a moment to go back to session zero, the documentation we had from that day and see, okay, now we have this question, we can go back to this first document we made does it still relate to this? Do we still want to do this in the first place what we said that two years ago? Mm -hmm. Or is this the moment to change the path or whatever? And there are so many things you said that are part of that, like the open dialogue, the, the listening to other people, and that has to be there constantly throughout the whole time. And then also acknowledging if, if, if something doesn't work out or someone doesn't want to be part anymore. And conflict is not something negative. I think we see conflict often something as Something we don't talk about, we have to take out of the room, and it's like, no, because after the conflict, when we get through that point, that's why it gets exciting again, because we agreed on something, or we, we find a path where the bond between the people participating is stronger. And I think that is a really, really nice thing. So my, my thing I always think about is having one document, having one thing, one I don't know, sketchbook, whatever that had might look like, where we can go back to afterwards in, in the throughout time. Um it helps a lot to disagree on things again or disagree on things again, <laughs> which is also completely okay. I think something I did was also saying, uh, or when she was uh, discussing before is the importance of collective governance and how we yeah. in moments maybe uh, where we we need also to sometimes get out of power uh, and try to listen, as mm. it was mentioned, and go to find a consensus and really action. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, more we are, and I think more we are passionate in a way on the, the value and the vision that we want to promote, that there, there will be a lot of intensity on the discussion, and maybe we will take time and uh, a lot of energy, emotion to go to the points of co-creation. But let's say that uh, the, the journey worth it because after we have a really better understanding of who we are, where we are, what we are doing with who, 
and we create really an ecosystem which is more based on trust and yeah and it's important so yeah. i think to to relate to that well i've seen in the past and i think it's changing a little bit but in the textile and fashion um field um it's changing but there's still a little a lot of people that um okay there's a lot of people that um it's they don't want to share like for example suppliers like some years ago i had a project a website that remind me of what you were explaining it was a website with suppliers uh, from all around spain i can give you all the information <laughs> on my data <laughs> no, so the, the thing is that there was this like there was a lot of designers and crafts trying to look for suppliers and factories most of the factories were closing and then it was like let's do a website um just for fun and just to help all everyone to look for suppliers and factories etc and everyone was like oh that's an amazing idea so we did it for like in our spare time with zero euros we put up the money ourselves and then everyone was like it's a super great idea yeah and then i was like cool so share with me all your suppliers and your, all the factories that you use to produce and i will put it on the website and we all share and no one wanted to share it so it was like uh not no not i mean some of them share but i would say like 60 percent they didn't want to share they just want to have all the contacts so now if this is changing i think so and i hope so but um it was very disappointing to me because it's like sometimes like if I share, for example, my knitting supplier, it doesn't mean you're gonna make exactly the same thing you're doing. It's just a supplier, it's just a material, just a technique, and there's like a thousand million things you can do. And I was very surprised. But this comes a lot from the also the fashion uh, yes. education and the discipline. Because fashion is super competitive mm. the, the students they don't want to show the things they are doing because mm. they don't want the other to go and buy the same fabric yes and this here inside here is completely the opposite so in our case when the, hope. <laughs> the, the, when the fabric academy <laughs> students come every year there is this shock every time okay <laughs> so because they come from fashion design or textile mm. design and they get like no here everybody will show everything and we will learn from each other and they are oh but this is because they come from a more i think that the fashion and the textile background yeah. if they have studied that it's promoting a lot of the like competitiveness more, yeah more secret for example i wish i could like some years ago, I knew Shasha Donas Pusidoras because I had like a million people asking me where can I sell things. And I, I don't know. And I was looking for this Shasha for many years and I, I found it today. So <laughs> it's <laughs> never late. So uh, yeah, and I was like, if people ask me where to do, like where I buy my material, I mean, not doesn't mean that you're going to do the same thing, but it's, it's still this like, so, so mentality. Thanks God that I well I didn't think, continue my project. It got hacked. I was doing it in my spare time, and I was like, I don't have time. So I'm gonna pass you everything to you because <laughs> I think it's like it's basic that people know. Like if we don't help each other, who's gonna help us? Like everything. Like all a lot of factories were closing down. Uh, suppliers were. Like, then then the question would be how we can make it appealing and attractive for the people to want to be there yeah so like to cre create the opposite no the opposite yeah. <laughs> it's somehow something inverse uh, psychology yeah no? like opposite psychology i know but it's complicated and sometimes i was contacting the factories and i'm like hey um you can be on the website for free and all the designers that are looking for factories can find you and they were like yeah i already have clients and that especially happened in small villages in Spain. And I was like, ah, okay, so there's no way to reach them because they don't have internet or websites, etc. So I think, but it's changing. There's there's hope, and there's things like Charcha de las Cusidoras, which is really cool, and I hope it exists everywhere on the planet. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I did want to say something. <laughs> maybe a final one. I from the the Charcha and travel experience. Um, we we share that 
is, is very important. Uh, needs patience. Yeah, it's very important. Um, work in in group is going slow. It's going slow. Going slow is not bad. But, if, but you need patience. Uh, is very very important is um, collaborating in a big way. In a big way is um, living the competition. Say, collaborate, share with others, and and that is 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 a more important and so and and so uh, be sure to provide. Uh, more time than what is only involved in producing, for example, for decision making, time, learning, um, whatever. Uh, thank you. Um, so I will close uh, now. Um, so thanks, uh, thank us for joining uh, today. Um, we have a lot of information of what has been presented especially uh, about the Fabla Barcelona and the website of the Fabla Barcelona. We will can provide also all the link uh, from the other initiative. We will continue to work on the project uh, she makes uh, the, all the year. Uh, so uh, you can follow us in the social media. We have a great uh, Voices series of live interview, uh, which uh, take place monthly. So feel free to, to join us. Um, uh, there is dialogue and also, uh, as we have done today, trying to capture a bit um, what is this uh, inclusivity uh, and empowerment means uh, to the textile and clothing industry. We will uh, be releasing a free learning path uh, that uh, the lab of the Shimex project are being producing now. Uh, of course, with the open source philosophy that has been uh, shared a lot uh, today, uh, that seems to be key, uh, apart from also having time, energy, uh, and uh, of course, uh, having the feeling to, to, to enter in those fields with, uh, with sustainable uh, revenue. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, reach out any Shimex lab that is around you. Here in Barcelona, you can join the Fab Lab, uh, and uh, if you want to get involved, uh, you want to say, it, to give your voice to the Shimex project, feel free to contact us. Many thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>